The death of a character can often be one of the most significant parts of any story being told, whether it's manga, anime, movies, novels, or whatever. For some, these character deaths can be one of the most memorable and impactful moments in a story, while for others, they're enough to make them want to stop entirely. Game of Thrones, JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, Berserk, Fist of the North Star, each of these stories carries a lot of weight behind each of the different characters' lives, and ultimately, when they come to an end, becomes something that everybody talks about. Another series very well known for killing off many of its characters is none other than Attack on Titan. Whenever I heard about it before watching it for myself, everybody could only say the following things. Oh my god, so many characters die, everybody dies, everybody's dying all the time, no one's safe. Naturally, coming off of the heels of things like Battle Royale, I went into this expecting just that. By the end of the first episode, we see Aaron and friends barely survive the Titans invading their town while his mother is eaten alive. Coupled with all the other innocent characters that get eaten along the way, you pretty much understand that this is going to be how things are. By the time episode 5 rolls around, Aaron and friends are now in the field ready to face the Titans themselves, and wouldn't you know it, they get wiped out too. Now as I mentioned, this is already par for the course for my expectations, but I guess what really caught me off guard was after building up Aaron and his story for all this time, suddenly this happens. And then... This happens. I remember in that moment, what went through my mind was essentially praise. All I could think was, wow, I am so impressed by this writing that they were willing to kill off a character this important to the story already, and I expected some kind of protagonist shift maybe to Armin or Mikasa instead. So after all the others managed to barely get by, still losing people along the way, you can only imagine my surprise when, suddenly, after all the shenanigans are over, this happens. It was in the wake of this moment that Attack on Titan lost something very important that I held in my mind the entire time. Attack on Titan lost its credibility when it came to killing off characters. Yes, at this point in time, many people have died, but... As I looked at it, I realized nobody important had died. And as I kept watching, this trend continued. And that's really where we get to the core of what this video is all about. For all of its character deaths, Attack on Titan never actually kills somebody who's important. Character death doesn't exist in the same way that it does in other stories. It serves as a vehicle to illustrate danger rather than an actual point of loss for characters. I'll explain a little bit more what I mean. Starting just with Season 1 of Attack on Titan, the first 24 episodes, what we have are 10 characters who graduate from Eren's graduating class as the top of the class. We also have people like Armin or Ymir who are not in the top of the class, but are still very much important to the story. We've also got other characters like Levi, Erwin, and Hanji who, just because of their role as leaders, are just as important as the cadets. Season 1 had no shortage of threats to these characters' lives. Every one of them was constantly in some sort of danger. But when we actually look at the death count featuring these important characters, only one of them has actually died by the end of the first season. Marco. Now at this point in time, you'd probably think, man, these guys are overdue for another death sometime. But it doesn't change. Rather than killing off any of these main characters, Isayama's writing style commits itself to introducing new characters that you can develop a small bond with and then killing them off instead to illustrate, again, just how dangerous all of this really is. Take a look at the female Titan arc, for example. Once Eren has joined Levi's squad, you get to meet a handful of new characters who have all been veterans of the military for quite some time, and each of them with their own pretty impressive Titan kill count. So naturally, you would think these kinds of soldiers would be completely safe and have no issues dealing with enemy Titans. Well, the female Titan just so happens to wipe out every single one of them other than Levi and Eren. Now what this does for you as the viewer is convince you, Oh God, like the female Titan is strong, like no, oh, nobody can beat her. By the end of this arc, what we have are a handful of characters who've been killed, including a few characters that you may have developed some sort of attachment to, but none of the main cast that I was talking about before. One of the most iconic moments from Season 2 in both the manga and the anime is the first appearance of the Beast Titan. Now, once again, this is a Titan who is, for all intents and purposes, one of the most dangerous things in the story thus far, but we don't really know that yet. We don't know anything about him. So what is the best way for us to illustrate that strength? Well, how about we take a character who we've talked about being second only to Levi, Mike, 
and have him go kill a bunch of titans by himself flawlessly, but then completely fall apart and cower in fear in face of the Beast Titan. And then have the Beast Titan talk to him, set up some intrigue, and then let him get eaten. So in a moment, we've lost the second strongest person in the entire Survey Corps, who, by the way, up to this point in the story, really hasn't done a whole lot compared to people like Levi or Aaron and Friends. I mean, he was always there, but he was never the most important character. He was just another side character. Moving into Castle Utgard, which is one of my favorite parts of Attack on Titan, we have this really cool scenario where all of the rookies are without their maneuver gear, so instead they're being escorted and looked over by these four more senior members of the military. Each of them is able to zip around and fight titans, but they should be safe at night until the beast titan shows up and everything goes to hell, and suddenly, by the end of the fight, all four of these people have been killed. All four of them, but none of the rookies who are very important to the story. We get a couple of close calls, as we usually do in these kinds of narratives, but none of them end up dying. In fact, Ymir reveals the fact that she can even turn into a Titan. So, at the end of the day, now we've gone through a number of different life-threatening scenarios where we've seen other characters get killed, but none of the important ones. But in your mind, you believe that there is danger because other characters did get killed. This all plays into that theme of deception that I've been talking about. You expect someone to die and... Indeed, that quota is filled, but it's filled with nameless or barely shown mooks who aren't really that important to the story. Now, in media, these characters are usually referred to as a red shirt. This comes from Star Trek, where the characters wearing red shirts that would go on the different planets with Kirk and friends would end up being killed to illustrate, oh no, things are dangerous. This is a very commonly used tactic in all forms of media, but the problem is, people believe Attack on Titan is just like your Game of Thrones, is just like your Battle Royale. You expect nothing less at this point. You expect someone important to be killed off soon, because this world has been illustrated as being so dangerous that you can't fathom that everyone's just going to keep coming out of this alive somehow. But they do. By the time we reach the end of Attack on Titan Season 3, these same principal important characters that I've been talking about, Aaron, Friends, the leaders, all these different characters are almost all there for the final battle except for Ymir. What we get are two different groups. The main Survey Corps unit that's going to fight Zeke and Aaron's unit that is going to support him while he battles Reiner. Isn't it convenient that when the Survey Corps is about to go on a final push to fight Zeke and are being told that every one of us are going to die, it just so happens to exclude all of Aaron's friends. By the time the battle is over, the final death count of this single conflict is huge. But, when we look at our character list, it's only two. Two characters of our most important characters list don't come out of this battle alive. Everyone else is totally fine! Wow. Yeah, Attack on Titan, as it turns out, does not actually kill everybody. In fact, it only kills you if you aren't important. At that point, you might as well just give up in advance, but unless you serve some sort of important plot point, you get a few more minutes of being alive until they kill you later. Everyone else? Well, enjoy the plot armor that you're gonna carry until the end of the series. Now at this point I'm going to talk about the manga a little bit, and I understand some people probably don't read it, so this is your moment to skip ahead or look away so you don't get it spoiled for you. But in the Attack on Titan manga, at the time of making this recording, has 117 chapters. A number of years have passed since the end of where Season 3 should leave off. A lot of things have happened. A lot of characters have come and gone. And now, at this point in time, all these years later, we finally have an additional character to add to the death toll. Sasha. Sasha has been killed. That leaves just John and Connie as the two people who aren't super important, but still important enough to be around still. We also got to see Levi recently get quote-unquote killed by an explosion, but... Last I checked, they didn't check the body thoroughly, nor did they put a bullet in his head. So I won't be too surprised when Levi happens to show up having miraculously survived this near-death experience. But hey, that's just how Attack on Titan is. If you're not a red shirt, you're gonna be fine. 
That aside, Attack on Titan still remains one of my favorite series. There's a reason I've been reading it every month since I started back in 2013 or 14 or whenever I began, and I don't intend to stop. I really enjoy Attack on Titan's writing, and I feel like, as far as narrative goes, it's got an incredibly well-developed story. I also think that in the very near future, we're going to see the end of a few more characters, but up to this point, well, <laughs> they've had a pretty good run. Until next time, this is StanPy. I hope you've enjoyed listening to me ramble about this subject. If you enjoy other videos like it, I do have some other anime-related discussion topics here on the channel, like whether or not Jonathan Joestar could survive the events of Castlevania. Whatever you may be into, I hope you'll check something out and stick around. As always, if you liked the video, please do click like to let me know, and of course, subscribe and turn on the notification bell if you haven't already. Also, please leave a comment. I love hearing them. Special thanks to all of my patrons who have been so gracious as to continue supporting me for all this time, and to all of you who are interested in being one, visit patreon.com slash standpy. Beyond that, I hope to see you next time, and hope that you'll tune in for my next crazy video about who knows what. Adi adi arrivederci. I'll see you then.